Then David took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Well, welcome again to North Shore. My name's Scotty. It's so good to see all of you who are with us in this room. I wanna say hi to everybody who may be joining us online, wherever you're watching from. We're glad you're with us as well. Uh, we're in, when we, in week, week two, excuse me, of this series, Live It Out. That's all about the life of this man, David, in the Bible. And today we come to a story uh, called, or about David and Goliath. It's one of the most well-known stories in the world. If you uh, have been around the church, you've heard it. If you grew up in Sunday school, you flannel graphed it. Uh, and even if you don't have a church background, chances are you've heard someone talk about a David taking on a Goliath, whether in sports or business or law or politics, because it's kind of become our culture's way of talking about this unlikely underdog taking on an overwhelming favorite. For example, for those of you who are from Washington State, uh, if you've ever watched the Apple Cup between Washington and Washington State, one team is usually the David and the other is usually a Goliath. Now, I'm not going to say which one is usually which, because as we all know, both teams fall short when compared to Stanford. But um, <laughs> all this really means is that I have my work cut out for me today, because here's the thing, pretty much everybody knows how the story ends. And if you didn't before the day, Goliath loses. So spoiler alert. There you go. That's how the story ends. But what I love about going back to stories like this is even if you've heard this story a thousand times and you could repeat it back to me verbatim, if your heart is open, I think you'll find today how little you understand it and how much it actually understands you. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app with you, I want you to open up to this book called 1 Samuel. It's kind of back towards the beginning in what's called the Old Testament. 1 Samuel, we're going to be in chapter 17 today. We're going to kind of just walk through the story, mostly what leads up to the part that everybody knows, uh, and kind of understand and learn what is this, this story has to say to each of us today. Now, just some context as you're moving your way there. At the time of the story, Israel is at war with their great enemy, the Philistines. And then we pick up the story starting in verse 2. Uh, the text says, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camp in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. Now notice the story doesn't, part, doesn't start by saying once upon a time. This isn't a fairy tale. It's a real story that takes place in a very historical place. I actually have a, a picture, a modern day picture of, this is the Valley of Elah running across the screen. And uh, we know that the Israelites were camped on the hill on the far side, the top of the picture, and the Philistines were on the near side. In fact, archaeologists have actually found remnants of Philistine pottery and even chariots on the near side where they would have camped and evidence of Israelite encampments on the, on the far side. So again, this isn't a fable. It's not a fairy tale. It's a real story that happened in a real place. And because of this unique geography of these hills around this valley, the two armies found themselves in kind of a standoff. Neither army wanted to risk making the first move and taking heavy losses until this one man, this one's Philistine, broke the stalemate. Look at verse 4. The text says that a champion, that word in Hebrew also means a substitute, someone who represents the rest of the people. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. 
On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. Now, to put all that in modern terms that we can understand, Goliath was well over seven feet tall. His armor weighed over 125 pounds alone and his spear was about the size of a car axle. So he's like, you know, UFC, MMA and a middle school bully, like all kind of pulled into one. And he challenged the Israelites to send out just one man to fight him to the death. Mono y mano, winner take all. He said this, choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And they were terrified because Saul didn't just, or Goliath didn't just make this announcement one time. He did this twice a day, every day, morning and evening, every day, for 40 days. Which means, think about it, after a while, all they could see, all they could imagine, all they could hear, the only thing on their mind was Goliath. By the way, has anyone else ever had a problem or a challenge in your life that felt so big it was just all you could see? I have a friend who's been struggling with his job and there are these coworkers that aren't cooperating and there's a boss that's not understanding and there's this promotion that's not been happening. And what I've noticed when we talk is that it's all he talks about. It's all he knows how to talk about now. He can't see anything else in his life is good health, his family, his friends, all he can see is this one Goliath, this one problem. And this is how fear works. This is how fear works in our lives. Many of you have experienced this with a problem, a Goliath in your life, like a problem in your marriage or financial hardship or a devastating loss or a devastating diagnosis. And we become consumed by fear, not just because it's a big problem, but it's because it's all we can see. In fact, that's, again, the way fear works. It's not just about the size of the problem. It's what happens to us when it's all that we can see is the problem, which is why Goliath, when he came out, nobody moved. He comes out on that field, nobody moves. Not Saul, not his son Jonathan, not David's older brothers. Remember the older brothers from last week who didn't get picked to be king? They're actually there, armed for battle, ready to prove themselves. Nobody moves. No one says or does anything until this young shepherd boy named David arrives on the scene. But he didn't come to do battle. No, 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 he didn't come for battle. He was there, get this, delivering food. His father had sent him to the front lines to bring food to his brothers. He said this, take this F off of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp, David. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. So David, he doesn't show off to take, show up to take on Goliath. He rolls up to battle with a cheese tray, right? He's like, you got to try the brie. It goes great with the pear. Like that's what he's doing. That's all he's thinking right then. And I love this detail in the story because David doesn't know he's going to face Goliath. He's just doing his DoorDash thing. Like he's just doing his job. He's just fulfilling the task that God had given him for that moment. And friends, that's the point. (laughs) That's the beauty of this moment in the story. You see, God can use the most simple, ordinary, everyday task like serving coffee or opening a door on a church Sunday to put you in a position to take down a giant. There's a woman on our staff named Kelly who oversees our front desk amongst many other things. And some people might think that answering calls or signing for deliveries is somehow less spiritually impactful than preaching a sermon or leading in worship. But with God, just the opposite is often true. I remember when one of our delivery drivers, whom Kelly had built a relationship with, had a loss in his family, and Kelly was on it, pastoring and arranging support and having our team sign cards. It changed this guy's life. Why? Because she was faithful with the little everyday things. She just made a point to get to know the guy who delivered the mail, and God took down a giant. 
So don't underestimate what God can do as you're staring at the face today or this week of some little seemingly insignificant task or responsibility. You might think, I'm on the sidelines. I'm not doing anything. No, God is preparing you and is going to use that moment to do something great in your life. David shows up delivering food, just there to bring the guys some bread and some cheese, which is when he hears that sound of Goliath twice a day, every day, the same threat. Send me a man, send me a soldier, send me anybody. And so David turns to a group of soldiers and says, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, I love David's question. It might sound a little audacious, maybe a little bit greedy, but here's the thing. David, when he sees this moment, he sees more than just the risk. All the other soldiers saw, all they saw was risk. All they saw was worst case scenario. But David doesn't just see the risk of facing Goliath. He sees the reward of facing Goliath. In fact, earlier in the story, Saul had offered great wealth his daughter's hand in marriage, and get this, no more taxes for the rest of your life. Can you imagine not having to pay taxes like for the rest of your life? I mean, somebody get me a sling and give me a giant. Like, can I get in the game there for something? But here's my point. There's not just a risk when you step out in faith. Yes, there's risk. There's not, not just a risk. There's a reward as well. Sure, someone could respond badly if you risk to have that hard conversation, but there could also be forgiveness and reconciliation. Yes, you might feel embarrassed if you were to confess that struggle or secret, but you also might find freedom and healing. Yes, it's possible that God won't answer the way that you want if you pray for a miracle, but God might answer in a way that you need. And one of the reasons why we have to face Goliath in our lives is because God wants to reward us with his faithfulness. He wants to reward us with his goodness. He wants to reward us by, help, by allowing us to see what he can do when we trust him. Friends, I don't know what Goliath is in your life, how scary it may seem, how overwhelmed you might feel. And yes, there's risk. Yes, there's risk. Yes, there's unknown. But there's a reward to being faithful as well. Which is why, I love this, when David is brought before King Saul, this little shepherd boy brought to the king, he says, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant, that's me, David, is going to go out and fight him. And Saul's like, David, hey, I love your enthusiasm. It's real inspiring, but you're just a kid. And Goliath's a warrior, a champion. And then David says, and I want you to hear this. He said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David's basically saying, I know the circumstances are different. Before it was a bear, before it was a lion, and now it's this Philistine giant. But if God delivered me then, he can deliver me now. Anybody else need that reminder today? If God delivered you then, he can deliver you now. And again, I don't know what you're facing today. It could be a loss, a breakup, a crisis at home. But think about how God has delivered you in the past. Just do this exercise with me right now. Think for a moment. Go back into your past. Last month, last year, 10 years ago. Go back to some place where God showed up for you and provided Maybe he provided for you financially. Maybe he provided for your family. Maybe he brought the right people into your life at the right time. If God delivered you then, here's the truth. He can deliver you now. I don't care how big Goliath looks. If he delivered you then, he can deliver you now. If he delivered you then, he can deliver you now. And so Saul tells David, okay, if that's what you want, if this is the battle you want to fight, Go ahead and may the Lord be with you. And then the Saul does this kind of curious thing. He sees David. He's kind of there, got his, you know, his shepherd clothes on. And Saul's like, that's not going to work. And so Saul literally starts putting his own armor on David. Some of you know this part of the story. He like gives him his tunic. He gives him his helmet. He hands his own sword over to David. 
And to me, this is kind of a symbolic moment because I feel like this is what happens in the church so often as people are navigating the giants and crises in their lives. When someone's going through cancer or depression or divorce, what do we do? We try to outfit them with our own armor, don't we? Here, try this book. Check out this podcast or this video, read this verse. It really helped me. I'm sure it'll help you. And again, there's nothing wrong with sharing books or podcasts or verses. And we need the counsel and guidance from others as we walk through challenges in our lives. But here's the deal, and you know this, if you've been on the receiving side of lots of other people's armor, you know how easy it is to feel weighed down and almost paralyzed by all the other equipment that you're getting from other people, right? I mean, David's just walking around like a penguin with all this armor and he doesn't know what to do. And so often we can be paralyzed by all the input and all the stuff coming at us. Here's what to do and here's what to do and here's what to do. And not only that, trying to use somebody else's armor can often blind us to the ways that God has already equipped and prepared us for the challenges that are before us. It can lead you to think things like this. Well, if I just had the the faith of that person, Or if I just had the gifts of that person, or if I just had the temperament of that person, or the personality of that person, then, then I could take on this challenge. But here's the thing, friends. If you are a follower of Jesus, you already have all that you need. Because you are in Christ and you've been indwelled by the Holy Spirit and the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. And when you feel weak, God promises that his grace is sufficient no matter what the Goliath actually is. And by the way, by the way, this is so interesting. If you think about the reason why Saul's armor didn't fit David, it was because Saul was also kind of a giant, wasn't he? Remember back in his story, we found out, we find out that Saul was a head and shoulders taller than anybody else in Israel, which makes you kind of wonder who should have been out there fighting Goliath in the first place, right? Saul, you see, had all that he needed for this battle. He just lacked the faith. And so David takes off the armor, hands it back to Saul. He takes his shepherd's staff and a sling, and he walks out into the valley, and he picks up five smooth stones. And Goliath is there watching, ever watching. Who's going to come out? Who are they going to send? Who's going to be the guy? How big will he be? How great will the challenge be? And he sees this scrawny, weak shepherd boy, David, teenager, come out to meet him. And Goliath is literally offended. He's offended. He says, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And he curses David. He actually curses him. But David doesn't cower or turn around. He looks back at Goliath and says these remarkable words. Hear these words. He says, you, Goliath, come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you, not with a sling and stones, but in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord says, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. That's confidence, right? But it's not self-confidence. This is God confidence. This moment in the story kind of reminded me of this little book that I used to read to our son Jude before bed that was called The Little Engine That Could. Anybody remember the story, The Little Engine That Could? It's about this train engine that pulls a broken down train over a mountain by repeating this phrase, and you all know it, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And then I would tuck Jude into bed and I would tell him that if he woke mommy and daddy up, that little train engine would come and take him away. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I never, I never said that. I mean, maybe once, but I never, I never meant that when I said it. It's just no, no perfect parents in the room, right? Here's my point. Here's why I tell you that story. We don't take on Goliath by saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And it's not because self-confidence is a bad thing. It's because there's a huge difference between hoping that I have what it takes and knowing that God does. 
It's a huge difference. In fact, David refers to God in this text as the Lord Almighty. In Hebrew, it's Jehovah Shabbat. Jehovah Shabbat, which means the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies who literally goes out into battle before you, ahead of you, and he's stronger than any enemy you'll ever face, physical or spiritual. See, what's interesting, when David gives this speech, it's not because he's crazy or he's betting against the odds. It's because David is the one sane person in the room. He's the one person that knows the truth, that he's not actually the underdog. Because God is the giant, you see. God is the favorite. God is the sure bet. And here's the deal. No matter what you're up against, that's true in your life too. God is stronger than that sickness. And he's stronger than that loneliness. And he's stronger than that depression. And he's stronger than that heartbreak that you're carrying. Which, by the way, is why David didn't just like, you know, cautiously tiptoe out into the valley and just stand there and stare at Goliath. Look at what David does. I love this. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. I mean, Goliath is a beginning. He's walking out. He's got the car axle spear. He's ready to kill. And David just starts running. Honestly, I would have asked God to do something first. I just will confess, I would have asked God to do something in some way, like, God, if you could just cause Goliath to, you know, have a heart attack or choke on his dinner, then I'll run out there and take him down. But here's the thing, friends, faith doesn't work that way. I wish it did. I wish it did. Here's the hard news. Faith doesn't work that way. God's power comes alive, not before you step out in faith, but when you step out in faith. When you take that risk, when you have that hard conversation, when you confess that sin, if you want to take down a giant, you've got to be willing to step out and run to meet him in battle. So let me just ask you a question. Whatever you're facing in your life, whatever challenge lies before you, what would it look like to have the faith, not just to stand there and wait for the giant to reach you, but to run to meet him in battle? What would that look like for you? What happens today or this week in your life? What's the Spirit speaking to you right now? What would that look like for you? Which brings us to that part of the story that pretty much everybody knows. What does David do? He reaches into his bag. He takes out a stone. He puts it in his sling. He strikes Goliath in the forehead, and Goliath falls to the ground dead. And get this, the battle is over just like that. If you go back through the text, it took almost 50 verses to get here. It takes one verse for Goliath to fall. And that's the point, friends. You see, the battle, the giant, it feels so big. It feels so impossible. But in the end, it's no match for God. How do I know? Because that's what the life and death and resurrection of Jesus is actually all about. That's what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross when he came down from heaven as our champion, our substitute, our representative, ready to take on the real Goliath, the devil, mano y mano, winner take all. And when Jesus rose from that grave, the battle was was done. I mean, it takes two thirds of this book to get there. It takes one verse for Satan to fall. The battle's over because the battle is the Lord's. That battle you're facing right now, it's not just you and that sin or you and that struggle or you and that other person. The battle belongs to God. It's he who represents you. It's he who is fighting for you. It's he who's standing with you. And when God is with you, you are not the underdog because he's the giant, which means, which means, and this is so cool, the real threat in the story, guess what? It's not Goliath. I know how scary Goliath seems. I know the Goliaths in my life, but the real danger in the story is not Goliath. You know what the real danger in the story is? It's what was happening to all those soldiers back at camp. Remember all those guys that David showed up? He's bringing bread. He's bringing cheese. They're all hanging out by the campfire. If you were to ask them back in that moment, hey, how are you guys doing? How's it going? How's it going here at camp? I think most of them would have said, you know, actually, we're doing pretty good. We've got bread. We've got cheese. 
We got a little homebrew the Bible doesn't talk about, but was probably going on, right? Like, we got it all. We got the campfire. Like, we're comfortable. We're safe. We know Goliath is way over there, but we're safe in camp. We're safe here. We've got everything we need. We've got a good life. You know, we got three meals a day. We've got all the provisions. We got all the comfort. We're doing fine. Friends, that is the danger in the story. It's not actually facing the giant. It's being so comfortable back in camp that we forget there's a real battle going on out there. We forget there's a real enemy who's breathing out fear and disgracing the name of our God and creating havoc in people's lives. And the question is, are we going to do something about it? Are we going to do something about it? We who have the power of Jesus and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the God of angel armies who goes before us, are we going to run out into that battle? Or are we going to sit comfortably by the fire, eating our cheese in the safety of the camp? And by the way, by the way, I'm not talking about going out and fighting culture wars or trying to stick it to those people. I'm talking about going out and loving people. I'm talking about going out and living sacrificially. I'm talking about going out and showing people that there's, that who have been made in the image of God, that there's a God who loves them and made them for a reason. That is what's at stake. That is the battle raging around us every single day. And that's why every single week, when you come here to church, we're going to challenge you in some way to get out of that chair and get out there and serve and lead and give and pray and sacrifice. It's why we're starting a new campus in Mill Creek. It's why we partner with organizations all over the world who battle things like food insecurity and homelessness and human trafficking. The battle is the Lord's, but Goliath doesn't fall if David doesn't get out on that field. The battle is the Lord's, but Goliath don't fall if David doesn't get out on that field and run to meet him in faith. And the cool part is after Goliath falls, we're told that the men of Israel and Judah surge forward with a shout and pursue the Philistines. In other words, David's faith inspires others to act in faith as well. And so can yours. So can yours. When you give sacrificially, you inspire someone else to do the same. When you show up at an AA meeting, you'll inspire someone else to do the same. When you confess that struggle or sin, you'll inspire somebody else to do the same. Fear of Goliath is really contagious, but so is running to the battle, friends. So is running to the battle. And that's why your courage, your faith, it matters so much. And not just for you and for your Goliath. It matters for everybody around you who will be inspired and encouraged to get out on that field in faith as well. Which raises one last question, and we're going to close with this one. How did David do it? How did he do it? Like, really, think about it. How did David do this? I mean, what gave him the strength to trust God so completely when nobody else would? I mean, he didn't know something that the other guys didn't. They all knew the stories of God's faithfulness and the, delivery from the ex- deliverance from the Exodus. And they all knew the stories. They all knew the history. What gave David the strength? What gave David the perspective? What gave David the faith, the belief, the courage to get out there and do this? What made him different than everybody else? Well, the answer is right there in the middle of the story. When David walks out into the middle of that valley to that stream, I've read the story a countless number of times. I've never seen it until recently. David reaches down and he picks up five stones, right? Visualize it. What do you have to do to pick up five stones off the ground? You got to kneel. You see, friends, the battle isn't fought and won with our money, our power, our influence. The real battle is fought right here on your knees, surrendered before the living God who's stronger than that sickness and who's stronger than that fear, who's stronger than that struggle. You know, I was just, I was thinking about this past week about how I spend my moments when I'm staring at Goliath and how most of my minutes each week are spent worrying and afraid and how many minutes a week I spend doing that versus how many minutes I spend just on my knees contending, asking, praying, God, this is your battle, do something. And I actually kind of audited this past week and it wasn't even close. I mean, I spent countless minutes in my mind and worrying and afraid and just a few on my knees and we've got it, ba- we've got it backwards. We got to flip that. 
because this is where the battle is fought and won. And the best part is anybody can do this. You're feeling overwhelmed right now, you can get on your knees and pray. You don't know where to turn, you can get on your knees and contend to God. You don't know how you're gonna make it through, how you're gonna get through this next step. You can surrender on your knees and say, God, this is your battle, lead it, fight it, deliver me. If you deliver me then, you can deliver me now. And so here's what I want us to do as we close our time together Before you go out and face the challenges that God has put before you, before you try to draw up the strength and the courage, before you go back to all your worries, all your fears, we're going to take some time and do the real fighting right here on our knees. So if you would, if you just close your eyes. And I want to invite you, if you're willing, actually to get out of your chair, if you're able, maybe in the middle of your row or come down and actually get on your knees. And don't be afraid about what people think. Here's the thing. It's not that we're too desperate. We're not desperate enough. (laughs) I'm not desperate enough. But if you have a Goliath in your life, if you're facing a challenge you can't win, this is where you go. This is what we do. And we're gonna pray. Jesus, here we are in the middle of that valley preparing for the challenges ahead, knowing that outside this room, maybe today, maybe this week, maybe this month, there's a Goliath coming our way. And I'll just confess, I don't have what it takes. We don't have what it takes. Left to ourselves, we are just the little underdog facing overwhelming odds. So Jesus, here we are on our knees before you the real giant, the real victor, the real champion, the real substitute, who's already won, who's already defeated sin and death and darkness. Jesus, the battle is yours. This battle, our battle, the battle we're facing, it is yours. We surrender, we give it to you, and we pray now that through the power of the cross, and with angel armies around us, that we could walk boldly into this world where the battle rages on, where the devil's wreaking havoc, that we would be people of faith, willing to run out into that battle with all courage and faith, knowing that you have already won and you've already risen and the giant's already fallen and we don't have to be afraid. And so Jesus, meet us here in the valley, meet us on our needs, Hear our prayers, hear our fears, hear our cries. Lord Almighty, Jehovah Shabbat. 